All right, welcome back to T-Rex Talks. We're gonna be talking about the Second Amendment, specifically the history of the Second Amendment. That's something that you guys have been asking about on some of my live streams. Um, and because this is also a podcast, I just wanna remind you guys that you can look it up on iTunes and Stitcher and all the other podcasting things. Uh, to find T-Rex Talks are a little bit easier to get that way. Last week's was not a very good podcast because Lucas was showing stuff with the real camera, with the night vision camera, it was a much better video, but this one will probably be a decent yeah. podcast. And for those of you who are listening, I am Isaac, because we always forget to introduce ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm David. We always forget to introduce ourselves. <laughs> um, thank you so much for watching. We're going to be talking about the history behind the Second Amendment. And part of the reason we're talking about it is because of trends today. Yep. Legally speaking, the trends uh, related to the Second Amendment and the Constitution are bad. But practically speaking, a lot of the trends that we're seeing related to the Second Amendment and what the Second Amendment is actually about um, are good. Yeah, quite, it's quite good. Yeah, it's I think a lot of Americans and I've, I've run into this so many times talking with people about gun rights going back um, 15 years or so. They have this feeling like, oh, no, everything's getting worse and worse and worse. And the that really is not um, accurate based on the American American experience of the last 15 years or so. Um, so, you know, in American history, we have the Second Amendment start. Let's see where we're going to put my hand. You know, it starts somewhere over here, and then it progresses along through history. And then you come into the early 1900s, um, 1930s, and that's when you have the NFA get passed. and Gun rights, control begins. Yeah, gun control begins in earnest. Gun rights take a huge dive, and there's a couple more of these over the years. So you have this big downward trend. And then it starts picking back up and going the other way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a lot of people don't know about this this turn where it starts going the other way. Especially um, if you're not old enough to remember <clears throat> things like the Clinton assault weapons ban right. and stuff like that. The fact is today we're seeing amazing trends. Uh, and I would say you don't even have to look back that far. If you yep. just look at gun sales this year, the gun yeah. sales this year are amazing. We've already sold more guns in 2020 than were sold in all of 2019, which was a record year. Yeah. We're, we're continually mm. having record years for gun sales, and 2020 is just an unbelievable record year. And we'd be selling so many more guns right now uh, if they were actually in stock. Right. We'll never know how many people wanted to buy guns simply because there just weren't enough guns for them right. when they went to the store. Yeah, so I think the, the uh, Clinton assault weapon ban, the 94 weapon AWB, was the very low point of mm -hmm. federal gun laws because it got passed and the next election cycle, the Democrats lost the House. Mm -hmm. And they, they had had it for a long time, they lost it, and they didn't get it back again for a long time. And that was like, it seems like that was a big message to Democrats to back off, at least at the federal level. Mm -hmm. I think, and I actually think that's the last time that we see Democrats actually doing gun control. Uh, successfully at the federal level. At the federal level. What Democrats usually do is gun control at the state level, and then they whine and complain and demand that Republicans do gun control at the federal level. Right. So. But then that doesn't really happen. And so, so we see this, this crash at the bottom, and then it's turning around and coming back up ever since. And it's actually really interesting because um, I was young at the time that that happened, but I was watching firearms news with my dad and you know, my dad used to do stuff for Gun Owners of America way back when. And um, so we were kind of, I think, a little more, probably more clued into it than our peers at the time. Um, and then coming into the early 2000s, when, you know, in 2004, that gets repealed, you know, because it's it sunset. It was a 10-year bill. It sunsetted, and suddenly all these new guns were available. And mm -hmm. then yeah. not that long after that, um, Obama is elected, and... Obama, I think, is the guy that made the AR-15 the American rifle. The greatest gun salesman ever lived until yeah. this year. And specifically, the greatest gun salesman of, uh, you know, assault rifles. Because um, yes. yeah. he didn't just sell any old gun. He sold evil assault weapons. Um, it's Because it was really interesting. Before Obama, there were, you could get AR-15s, and there were now um, these... Guns, AR-15s with features. I remember when I first was buying guns, it was like, this is a featureless AR-15. Referring they back still to have the, those in some states. In some states they do, but you know they still were using that, lang that lingo in early 2008 when I was first bought my fa first AR, and um, which made it kind of confusing for me, a noob. 
But it was very interesting because a lot of people were like, oh, this person, he has an AR-15. You know, you might go on a government list if you buy an AR-15. And that was oh, yeah. very much the vibe amongst the gun owners that I talked to. You know, regular people bought pump guns and wheel guns and maybe Glocks, but ARs and AKs were very different. And actually, I was just looking through my, my old gun files of stuff that I'd saved over the years, <laughs> and I found this really funny... Um, journalists guide It'd be nice if we could show it to you but that's a level of technological complexity we have in 2020 here. we can't do it but it was a journalist's guide to firearms identification it said you know machine guns and assault rifles and it says it has a picture of an ak m16 a picture of an ak-47 um uh, sorry a picture of an m16 and it says ak-47 and then an uzis and every other gun possible those are all ak-47s yes and it's kind of interesting to look back and realize there was a time before the AR-15 was the boogeyman weapon of the... Of and it was the AK-47. The and it was yeah. the AK-47. That guy dates to like 2013. So this was before the explosion of interest in the AR-15. And, you know, the kind of the rest is history. I think the other thing that really changed the trend uh, for the last 10 years or so um, has been YouTube. Yes, it's gone from people saying, I'd rather not, I want an AR-15, but I'd rather not buy one because line up on a list, to I really should buy another AR-15 so that I can put it on Instagram. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and it was so interesting. I think what happened was people were like, oh, these are scary anti-government militia type weapons. And then they, they went on YouTube and they're like, oh, there's all these people posting videos on YouTube of them doing cool stuff with them and enjoying them. I guess it's normal. I guess it's okay. Oh. I think I would like to own one of those. And so I think that YouTube... Normalization. It's yeah. kind of ironic. YouTube and Obama, I think, are largely responsible for the popularity of the AR-15 and popularizing it. Yeah, and yeah, not just normalizing it, but popularizing but it. So, and now in 2020, uh, a lot of the conversations that people were having before, like, yeah. why do you need a 30-round magazine? And we're seeing giant riots where there's in excess of 30 people gathered together. You're seeing people using firearms for defense. You're hearing stories of police officers mm -hmm. and 911 dispatch saying, no police can come to your location. You're on your own. And that is why so many guns are being sold right now. And that is why uh, even Democrats are buying guns. Apparently, this is hard to quantify, but apparently one in every nine Democrats has bought a gun this year, which mm -hmm. is, uh, depending on who you ask, either a super high or a super low number. Now, the other thing that's happening this year, you may not be aware of this, there's also a presidential election going on. Um, really? Yeah, it's, it's As hard if 2020 to, couldn't get wor any worse. <laughs> it's hard to imagine that uh, this is happening because the media actually sort of stopped talking about Joe Biden for some reason, <laughs> but he's still actually running for president. And um, the Democrats, the DNC, and Joe Biden to a lesser extent, and Kamala Harris to a larger extent, are really uh, doubling down on gun control, which is a fascinating thing to do at a time when even a lot of Democrats are buying guns. You know, the, right. every every town is still running the figure 95% of Americans want more gun control legislation. That is not true in 2020. Not even 90% of Democrats want more gun control legislation. Apparently. What a percentage of Democrats want is more guns, more personally owned guns. So this is obviously not a practical decision to push for more gun control. It's not something that is based on what the voters want. It's not something that's based on polling data. It's not based on even the narrative that uh, mm -hmm. the police are too militarized and the police need less guns. The same people who are pushing for more gun control are also saying that right, right. now. So obviously this push for more gun control is not practical voter-based, it is actually an ideological thing that yep. flies in the face of the Second Amendment on purpose. Yeah. Um, well, so let's talk about that. Yeah, well, I just find it so interesting. You know, for, for the last decade or 15 years or whatever, the argument has always been, you don't need guns. You're not qualified to own guns. That's what the police are for. The police are there to take care of you and solve all those violence-related problems. And now the message of the Democrat Party is defund the police. And then what? And, and then and then and then someone takes guns away from you. It turns question mark. It turns profit. into this perfect pacifistic utopia. Like there, it, it's like yeah, it's it's very confusing. Yeah, so what, it's so kind of humorous. So what we want to talk about is this this idea. There there are two prevailing ideas when it comes to this conversation. 
And there's a phrase that is increasingly used, and I think it's good that it's increasingly being used, which is monopoly of violence right. or monopoly of force. Um, official vocab guidelines say that violence is too forceful and force uh -huh. is too forceful. So monopoly on violence is a phrase that basically says the state needs to maintain the monopoly on violence. It's important that um, the private citizens do not yeah. have that. Official vocab is monopoly on violence. Yes. People trying um, to change it to monopoly on force are trying to get around what it actually is and what it actually means. Right. There's basically two ways you can do this. Either the state has a monopoly on violence or the people have a monopoly on violence. Or, or maybe they share. You know, you could, and like, that's kind of what we've got going right now. But so, yeah, so, you're not sure who actually has the upper hand and who is actually outgunned. Right. But when so, push comes to shove, one side is going to end up with the monopoly on yeah. violence. So the founding fathers wanted the people to have the, the monopoly. The statists want the government to have a, a monopoly. And there's a whole trend arguing for the state having it. So I stumbled across this term as an actual term. I was doing some writing on gun, gun rights and gun laws and stuff. And um, I was just kind of reverse engineering the liberals' mindset. It's like, why, why do they care about flash hiders? Why do they care about bayonet lugs? Like, I have never once heard of anyone getting bayoneted to death except in a wartime context using actual soldiers. Um, I think I heard of a pig getting bayoneted once in a pig hunt, but that's about it. So they, they were obsessed about features that have no bearing on crime. And the only way I could... I could extrapolate from what they were saying and doing was they must have a complete ideological and a self-conscious uh, ideological opposition to people ever owning any kind of weapons. And then I, I typed in a Google monopoly on violence or monopoly on force and bingo, I popped up this thing and there's this guy called Max Weber in 1919 and he wrote an essay called Politics as a Vocation and he argues that mm -hmm. the state has to maintain a monopoly on violence in order to be legitimate. This is kind of the whole crux of their position. If the state doesn't have a monopoly, then it's arguably not a legitimate state. Mm -hmm. So this is what they've been pushing for, and this is, I think, been, been what's been driving their thought process. And so they freak out about weapons. That was, and that's clearly what it was. Like, well, hunting stuff might be okay if it only holds a couple rounds, but anything that's a weapon must be forbidden. And I'm going to mute my phone real quick. Yeah, and that's something that often comes up when people are talking about AR-15s, when um, many of the folks who have been uh, pushing for more gun control, they focus in on the AR-15 as a weapon of war. A weapon mm -hmm. of war has no place in our streets. A weapon of war has no place in the hands of a private citizen. A weapon of war is too hard to use. Uh, it's called a bullpup because it knocks you down. Wait a minute, that was not, <laughs> that was somebody else. That was something else. But um, this, this idea that weapons of war cannot be in the hands of private citizens uh, oh. because we specifically are trying to keep the monopoly of force in the hands of the state is a very powerful dominant idea. And it is the literal opposite of what the Second Amendment is trying to accomplish. Right. The Second Amendment's whole purpose is to prevent any infringement on the ownership of privately held weapons. Arms specifically means weapons, not toys, not plinking accessories, not hunting equipment, arms. Right. Um, the whole purpose of the Second Amendment is to keep the monopoly of violence, or the monopoly of force, we could call it that, but keep the monopoly keep of the violence yeah. and the ownership of weapons in the hands of the people so that they can protect themselves from the government. And... The main thing that we're going to talk about, now that we can finally get around to it, is minutes in. the fact of the matter is this idea does not start in America in 1776. Well, let's start with um, the, the Bill definition. of Rights. Yeah, let's start with the definition. So when we scroll back and we look at the Bill of Rights being ratified in, um, what was it, 1791, 1790? Um, Go back you know, to the 1828 English Dictionary. Well, yeah, so I've got, I just pulled up real quick. Webster's 1828 is the American Dictionary, the first one that was produced, very iconic, and it has a definition of arms. And so our right, in, enshrined in the Second Amendment, is the right to keep and bear arms. And this keeps, people keep trying to twist this into it being about sport, um, but the word arms is defined as weapons of offense or armor for defense and protection of the body. And if we scroll back, like some might argue, oh, well, that's a new definition that the Americans came up with as a result of this war. But if you go back another... Um, Even if that 70... were true, it would still mean that the Second Amendment means arms. 
yeah, like, well, that's clearly what they meant, yes. right? But, but it's if you, not a new if you, definition. If you scroll back to 1755, there was this guy named Johnson, and he wrote what some people consider to be the first dictionary, and he has an almost identical definition. So it's kind of, it would be erroneous to think, well, he defined it this way, and he defined it this way, but in the middle, these people just went off and used this totally different definition. So they were totally thinking arms and we can as go an back individual right. Further, we yeah. can go back to the assizes of arms... Yeah, 1181. So, so this is the really interesting thing. So, almost nobody has what I would argue. You know, I'll rephrase it. It's rare for people to have what seems to be a completely new and original thought, Correct. especially with large, complicated stuff like government. Uh, people are almost almost always building off of something they've seen before or experienced before, um, whether that's in civil government or church government or business. Um, we tend to see things and go, oh, look, here's how they solve that problem, and then we copy. Yeah, if ever, um, if ever you come across somebody who believes that he has a completely new and original idea, what you are actually seeing is someone who is ignorant of history, because there is nothing new under the sun. Yeah, so, um, so there was this idea that was kicking around, and there was this idea that caused the um, American colonists to be incensed that the British government was trying to take their weapons. Um, and it was definitely weapons because they were organizing into militias and they were getting ready for a civil war, basically, a war against the crown. And they were getting things like cannons and, and uh, other weapons of war. And stockpiling ammunition. And stock, yeah, and so they were doing all this stuff. And then when the British came and actually tried to take it, they saw this as going against their rights. And that idea goes way far back through English history. Um, and I've tried to study this, and it's... Um, it's very interesting because basically what happens, if I could summarize it in very tight format, every hundred years or so since England has been England, um, sometimes less, various kings have passed various laws um, regarding weapons and basically mandating or making uh, compulsory weapons ownership. So I'm going to pull up the Assize of Arms 1181. The first one. And this is something that we see throughout Europe. I'll just zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Throughout Europe, the feudal system is something that is pretty decried nowadays as being um, unfair and uh, patriarchal and problematic amongst the woke folks. And probably masculine. Usually was. Yeah. That's why the patriarchal thing. But one of the things that's interesting about it is <clears throat> it has decentralized power structures. Even right. in areas where you have a king, he is dependent upon the nobility, and the nobility are dependent upon the guys under them to actually raise up an army. Very few people could afford to have a standing armor, army. They really right. depended upon the peasants to support uh, the nobility to actually be combat ready, <coughs> and those peasants to also be some level of combat ready themselves. Yeah, Different countries do this different ways. For example, there's a long... Uh, I was going to say glorious, but that's the wrong word. There's a long tradition of Italian mercenaries who are kind of like uh, they're semi-professional semi soldiers, not a standing army, but not local guys. Yes. Um, occasionally you see large empires that do have standing armies, professional yes. armies like the Romans. Well, but they didn't start there. They didn't start there. They, right. they go back further than that. But throughout Europe, after the fall of Rome, you tend to see decentralized power structures. And you tend to see in the countries that are more Christianized, value placed upon the life of the serf and the peasant responsibility placed on the serf and the peasant. There's actually a consent of the governed thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at, um, it's, it's easier to see this in Britain than anywhere else for several reasons. One, uh, we can mostly read the history. We can mostly read the history because <laughs> it's English. We don't actually speak any other languages personally. Even when you go back a pretty, pretty long way, it's, it's, it's a lot stuff. more accessible than German history or Chinese history or something like that. And being an island, they managed to avoid some of the worst trends that were sweeping through the continent. And so you end up with a very interesting British tradition of the common man actually being a free man and actually taking part in the national defense of his country. Yep. And uh, what's your favorite battle? Um, think, think, yeah, I'm uh, well, it. it's, 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 as, well, there's no, no. several. Okay, so what's your favorite battle that never happened? I was setting you up for that. <laughs> So this, this is kind of a big premise for us, um, tied into what, why we do what we do at T-Rex. Um, so um, Runnymede is one of my favorite battles because it's a battle that never happened. Uh, there was a tyrannical king. He was opposed by force, and that force was so overwhelming 
that he was forced to capitulate without even fighting. And that force was not a foreign enemy. That force was his direct underlings, his direct underlings that he demanded do things his way. Yep. And they actually stood up and said, we're not going to tax the people. We're not going to do all this stuff that you demand. Right. We're actually going to stand up and oppose you yeah. with force of arms. And uh, rather than fighting, he actually stood down. The battle never happened. Right. He signed the Magna Carta. It's very famous. The Pope canceled it. He was later forced to sign it again, I believe. Um, <laughs> yes, but, let's not get too complicated. But basically, and there's some problems with it. But but there were basic. There's a really fundamental premise there, which is, you know what? In English history, the king is not the unlimited sovereign that can do whatever he wants. There are limits that are placed on him, and he is forced to to submit to the broader um, will of the people in England. And this this concept is carried on throughout English history, where you have things like the English Civil War, where the king is ultimately tried for treason, and stuff like this. Um, but we're kind so, of, you kind of touched on an interesting thing, which is the kind of the military structure idea. Yes, um, and one of the reasons that we that. see, well, so one <laughs> of the reasons that we see this in, in England specifically is there are a few key events that completely change the culture. Yep. And the Magna Carta is one of them, not just because it is a important legal document that they have to stick to, but also this idea that the lesser magistrate, Somebody who has an office but is lower than the king can actually step up to the king and say, no, you have exceeded your limits. You're actually breaking the law. We're actually going to pull you back underneath the law, and I'm going to interpose myself between you and your subjects who you are mistreating and stop mm -hmm. you. That idea becomes part of British culture, and uh, you actually see it pop up again and again. And so when you see the colonists in America deciding that they're going to push back against George III, it isn't this new crazy idea that comes out of nowhere. Right. It is actually one of the most British things that the colonists ever did. Right. Uh, they're doing exactly what the British did against uh, James I and Charles II. Um, they didn't think they were doing a brand new thing. They thought it was just what we do, episode six, Yeah. You know, the continuing saga of, well, of British free men. Well, see, but like, what was Patrick Henry's quote? Um, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I had his Cromwell, and George III, trees and, trees and they're like, trees and trees, so like, can learn from their example. Yes. Because that's what they were thinking. There's this idea where a tyrant is opposed and, and deposed um, so that the lawful order can continue. Um, yeah, in many they, ways, yeah. There's, we often kind of rejig things by saying, like, Britain is this thing, and the Americans want to do something new and break away and chart a new course. And in some ways... America was, or the American colonists, when they founded America, they were more in keeping with British common law and British tradition of free men and armed citizenry mm -hmm. than where Britain, Britain was headed. Yeah. Britain was headed in a, a different direction, a more problematic direction, and England um, was trying to drag America with it, the American colonists, and they actually were being more consistent mm -hmm. than, uh, than Parliament was. So that is something that I think is a very important principle yeah. uh, to talk about and to get across because it's so easy to just say, oh, they did a new thing. They tried a thing that's never been tried. Yeah, the, the war for American independence is pretty amazing. And the way that America was consolidated and founded uh, was pretty amazing. But all of those ideas came before them. Mm -hmm. They were taking some of the best lessons of history, the best lessons um, that had been figured out over generations and tried to apply those. And so the Second Amendment doesn't come out of a vacuum. It comes out of um, Christendom, particularly, but more British, um, the British brand of that specifically. It's, it's leaning very heavily on very specific British traditions and very specific British laws. And then you can go back and you can look at the documents that they wrote after the Bill of Rights, the various militia acts and militia laws and the way that they activated and utilized militias. And you can actually learn a lot more what they had in mind when they talk about the Second Amendment. It's not a weird anomaly. It's not a weird new experiment. It's not something that is obsolete and we can put it back on the shelf now because it obviously didn't work out. Right. Uh, it's not something that's just a couple hundred years old. It's something that is uh, a very old concept, thousands of yeah. years old. And let's, um, yeah, so let's talk through some of that. So... If we rewind to the late 1700s, the weird anomaly at that time was um, basically the birth of the professional military system, where you have people whose career is military service, and you have a very large military apparatus 
uh, that is under the control of a centralized government, and they have this exclusive control over this asset. Um, that concept in recent history was really popularized um, by the Germans, well, the Prussians, and um, Charles, no, um, who was it, Charles? No, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, Frederick the Great, uh, his dad, um, Frederick William, I think. Wilhelm? Probably Wilhelm. He had this idea of creating this country with this massive military, with basically compulsory military service for everyone. Um, and he, he started crafting this centralized, monolithic military system. And it hadn't really existed before this. So this is like the 1720s. Yeah, even in the Roman uh, times, when there were gigantic Roman armies, there was still separation. There was, there's yeah. still this idea that you never let the army come back to Rome. You never let the army inside of Rome. The right. army is very separate from yeah. Rome itself. Yeah, but they but were, he was wanting to build. He was creating system. this thing, and it was very interesting what he did. He he um, he went in a lot of interesting directions, but like he would he would intentionally wear just a regular German military officer's um, tunic and, and clothing to communicate to his people, I am part of the military, I'm just like you, we all serve the state, concepts like this. Mm -hmm. So he started building this military, and he started making it more professional, and he ultimately handed that off to his son, Frederick the Great. <clears throat> and Frederick the Great then went and trashed basically all of Europe. And he took their, his military system that his dad had given him, and he took on the traditional military systems of a lot of these other countries, which was more decentralized, more distributed, um, more like these are people that they farm regularly, but then they can be brought in to conduct, you know, yeah, perform civilian, military services. Yeah, basically a levy system. Um, uh, and he trashed everybody. And so in the 1750s, 1760s, it suddenly started to become very, very popular for European countries to dump their old system and go to this Prussian style system. And this is part of why when the British officers come over to America and they see the militias, they are constantly mocking them. And they're like, oh, they just, they're so out, outdated, so old fashioned, they can't do a thing. Because they had just seen this happen in Europe where, you know, like at the Battle of Leuthen, um, Frederick the Great had 10,000 men and he took on 40,000 and he cleaned their clocks because his men were more disciplined. So they come over here and they see this old fashioned thing that the Americans are still trying to do and they, they laugh at them, and they don't take them seriously at all. At and, first. Well, no, repeatedly. Yes. So leading, it's, <laughs> it's actually really, lessons. it's really, really interesting because you see them in their, in their writings mocking them. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, if I draw my sword halfway up, they'll all run away. You know, stuff like this. And then Lexington and Concord happens. And they have like a week of, oh my goodness, this is not what we thought. And then they go right back into it, and they expect to just, just walk all over the Americans. And it keeps not happening the way they expect it to happen. Then things like Bunker Hill happen, and they discover, wow, these guys have the resolve and the discipline to hold a position in the face of overwhelming numbers and mow down our guys without batting an eyelid, and it takes everything we've got to take the hill. And so what we see is a <clears throat> lesson. I want to go back to sure. sort of the Prussian-style army. This idea that the, Europe got on the bandwagon, the Prussian bandwagon, basically saying that, oh, obviously, a giant powerful, centralized, standing army owned entirely by the state that obeys orders without question is clearly the superior military force. Yeah. We will switch to that because there's literally no downside. Right. Well, there are some downsides. There's some massive downsides. Like tyranny. Yes. Um, but the idea was we'll risk the tyranny because we're the ones in charge and we won't be tyrants. We'll just be in charge. Well, and, and we'll be in charge of a giant, powerful military, and that sounds like a fantastic plan. And, and this idea was that, um, that you mentioned that m militias were an old-fashioned concept that could not stand in the face of centralized statist force is something that is very interesting because everybody buys into it, and it gets tested in a big way in the United States, before they're the United States. And, the Ameri and America, the colonists, they're watching this, this transformation happen on the continent. And then the war happens, and they test their militia system, and they discover pure militia has weaknesses. You need In wartime, you need to centralize more. Um, mm -hmm. You need a command structure. Yeah, and, and, and you need more training, and you need to close up your equipment gaps and stuff. Um, but they're, they continue to be horrified by what they see, because there's stuff like the Prussian mercenaries that come over. Um, 
the deal the British crown made with Hesse Castle was, oh, you rent us soldiers. So those, those mercenaries were not coming over on their own volition as individual mercenaries. They were rented by the British government from that Prussian um, prince. And basically, these guys didn't get the money. Their, <laughs> their, their, boss got their the government money. boss got the money, and he got extra money if one of them died. Basically, <laughs> it was like a deal. you break it, you buy it policy. <laughs> and the Americans were seeing all this, and they were horrified that these you know, Germans were being treated this way. And so that's why a ton of Prussians were um, deserted <laughs> and then smuggled, smuggled westward by the uh, colonists, and they never went back. So the desertion rates were huge. Um, I actually know someone that's a direct descendant of some of those left behind German soldiers because the Americans saw these people to a certain degree as victims of a tyrannical government that needed to be helped as well. Yeah, and the so, same way that they were pushing back against the tyranny of George III, they could see the tyranny yeah. of uh, other continental powers. And yeah, yeah so, so, so the downsides of the giant powerful state of system <clears throat> that nobody control, can control because they have the monopoly on force uh, is apparent even yeah. as they're fighting against it. And I think it becomes more apparent in the 20th century. Yeah, but as, as the war concludes, as they win their freedom, as they go about creating a new country, um, or whatever you want to call it, um, they were discussing these same ideas and what do we do, how do we do our national defense. And in their writings, it's very clear that almost all of them just abominate the idea of a centralized mm -hmm. government system. In fact, they even go a little bit militia crazy, if I can use that term. Mm -hmm. Like they experimented with a militia navy. Where like rather than build warships with 40 guns on it, let's build a bunch of one gun ships. And basically we'll have volunteers that rush to the boats if the yeah. you know enemy fleet is coming. It's kind this of is like a kind volunteer stuff, firefighting system, but for naval combat. It's kind which, of kind of weird. <laughs> which would work better with surface to surface missiles than with guns. Yes. Actually, it's kind of ironic. Some of these concepts they were playing with actually work far better in the 21st century than they did at Back the time. Then. Yeah, as, as, as weapon systems have become more powerful, you can actually um, decentralize more. But um, with most systems, not all. So they, they saw this. They were horrified. They wanted to go in the exact opposite direction. They wanted an incredibly powerful um, people. And this is the argument, you know, when they're going through the ratification conventions and they're discussing well what is it what's going to happen if we all uh, you know form into this united states of america thing um what how do we know this thing isn't going to become a giant tyrannical monster that's going to you know consume everything and so i'm trying to find some quotes here i'm just pulling up um mm -hmm. some stuff here they were talking about this and, and explaining to the individual states this is what the second amendment means oh it you are supposed to have more enough power that the federal government could never possibly come close to taking any of your liberties. Because even if it could possibly raise up a standing army, you would so far outclass it that you, you know, we couldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole. Yeah, so Patrick Henry, when uh, Virginia is ratifying their constitution in uh, 1778, he says, guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, Nothing will preserve it but downright force. So this is a very important thing. So they're ratifying this document. But what Patrick Henry is saying is this document won't actually do anything. It is just a piece of paper. <clears throat> you have to preserve the ideas in this paper by upholding them, by remembering them, by obeying them. And also, ultimately, you will need downright force to preserve your rights. Whenever you give up that force, you are ruined. The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able might have a gun. So this is a very important thing, and it's not long after that. There, there are folks in England who are learning from this. Um, so Blackstone is... Uh, Here's oh, another good one. Here's You just he, lost my Blackstone. Oh, I'm phone. sorry. I'm, I got another good... Oh. So Blackstone is very, a very important uh, person writing commentaries in the laws of England, and he follows up with this exact same idea. Um, the right of self-defense is the first law in nature. In most governments, it has been the study of rulers to confine this right within the narrowest limits possible, which, by the way, is something that the UK is doing right now. They took away your right to defend yourself with a gun. Then they took away your right to defend yourself with a knife. Now you're not allowed to defend yourself with your fists or your feet. You're or only allowed to jump up and down, uh, run away. You cannot even defend yourself, which is actually part of the reason I think that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse has such a heavy-duty um, 
series of uh, convictions coming his way if well, if the to. prosecution has their way. Yeah. They're not prosecuting him for all of the little infractions. It is a self-defense case, and it yeah. would be a precedent against self-defense. Right. And it just so happens, in my opinion, mm -hmm. my, my reading of this is he made the mistake of defending himself against people who were politically correct when he was very politically incorrect. Yep. So this is a great opportunity to sway a jury to slap him with what would be a terrible precedent against self-defense. And this is something that is tied inextricably to this armed citizenry being able to defend themselves. That idea continues <clears throat> up to defending themselves against tyrannical governments. So, so. One, of the, one of the, total side note, one of the really interesting things about Kyle Rittenhouse is he's the age of your common school shooter, right? Um, he used an AR-15, the weapon of the school shooter. They're not really freaking out about the AR-15, though. They're totally vilifying him as an individual, right? Or am I missing... No, I don't, it's mostly him as an individual. Yeah. 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 The solution is not ban ARs, interestingly enough, in this case. Maybe it's because he went up against people with guns, but... Yeah, uh, the fact that people who were attacking him with guns means guns are not really a part of the conversation. It's just this white supremacy thing that he had going on. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah obviously that's what it was. Uh, but yeah, so, so this... The concept of self-defense against illegal threats from individuals or illegal threats from illegal governments, mm -hmm. they are the same moral argument. And so taking those away at one end of the spectrum requires that eventually you take them away at the other end of the spectrum. That's where a lot of countries are in Europe right now. Um, yeah. And that's why this conversation is happening. Even though people in America are buying guns like crazy because they want to protect themselves. That's why gun sales in 2020 are happening, yep. self-defense. Even though that is happening, there is a strong push from people who are running for office right now to take right. guns away from people. Well, I think I think it's not just that they want to protect themselves. I think it goes back even deeper than that, which is yeah. they have a they're losing trust in the government. You yes. know, there's the government makes a couple uh, implicit promises like we will protect you, we will take care of you, we will provide the security that you need to live your life, and as <laughs> 2020 has unfolded. Um, that that whole promise is to, is breaking apart very quickly, and people are losing trust in that system. Yeah. And so, if the government fails to protect me, clearly that's going to have to devolve on someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the only thing left. And so, I think that that's what's going on here. And the uh, American colonists they were totally not on board with this idea of the government providing all this security and protection. They needed to provide it themselves, and that's why they advocated for a militia-based military system, a decentralized yeah. military, where you did not use the federal government or the central government to maintain a large standing army. And they were very fearful of standing armies. Um, they had extensive debates about this. But the really interesting thing is, um, <laughs> for some reason, this never really gets brought up, but... Um, there's a bunch of arguments for explaining how the founders were thinking. And you can look at what they did at Lexington and Concord. You can look at um, dictionary definitions. You can look at English common law history, where they have all these laws mandating weapons ownership. Oh, yeah. Um, we never, we never actually talked about the size of arms. So the size of arms is interesting because... Um, well, there's several, but let's start with the Well, yeah, the 1181. There's also an awesomely named one called the Statute of Winchester. But it's in 1285 before yeah. Winchesters were a thing. So... So I think that's a I think that's a fluke. Um, it's kind of awesome though. But basically, it it's goes. It's a great through. call forward to Shaun of the Dead. But carry on. <laughs> so, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. So um, you can actually look this up on uh, Wikipedia, and they have the text. Um, but basically, what it does is it's, it is it goes through, and some of the points I would not look to. Um, but the first few points, like points one through four, uh, are things like if you have. Uh, if you're a knight, you need to have a shirt of mail, a helmet, a shield, and a lance. And, and if you have knights under you, you shall have as many shirts of mail, helmets, shields, and lances as you have these knights. And then, um, every free man who possesses chattels or rents in the value of 16 marks shall have a shirt of mail, a helmet, a shield, and a lance. And then if you only have property worth 10 marks, you have a hauberk, um, an iron cap, and a lance. And then, if you don't even have that much property, if you're just a Burgess, you have a Gambeson, an Iron Cap, and a Lance. Gambesons. So, so they, yeah, which is just basically padded, which is basically just. 
sorry. Which is basically just padded cloth armor. It is body armor. It is surprisingly yeah, effective body armor. Yeah. yeah, but it's not metal body it's armor. Not it's not the fancy stuff, but it's it the stuff. It's the stuff that regular people can buy. So this is really interesting because, and this is not that unique in military history to have this idea that like, oh, wealthy people, we're going to mandate that wealthy people have gear here. And then if you're poorer, you'll have gear down here. And then if you're e even poorer still, you only need to have this much gear, but you do still have to have gear. This kind of system um, was really normal. And this is kind of what actually the Roman, well, this is what Rome had before the Roman Empire. The word, Before the professional standing yeah, army. Yeah, so the word legion actually basically means levy. And a levy is there's a portion of the population that are eligible for military service. And what you do is when a war comes up, you call that levy, they come forward, they assemble themselves for military service, they go do their war, and then they come back and they go back to their normal jobs. And in Rome, you had to be a Roman citizen of a certain class. You had to own a certain amount of land. Mm -hmm. And then, then you were, as I understand it, required to own weapons because you were in this pool. And what happened was Rome as a, as a city-state had this system. And then in one of their wars with Carthage, they lost really badly. And a ton of the people that were actually eligible for military service died. Um, simultaneous with that, there was a, basically a system of land reforms where more and more of the farms were being bought up by fewer and fewer people. And so the pool of people they could actually draw from shrunk radically. And so I think it was in, uh, I think it's called the Marian reforms in about 250 BC. They reformed the military system. They said, you know what, let's do it differently. Let's have a professional standing army where we have guys with 25 years in the service when they sign up. And, ooh, cool feature, if you're not a Roman citizen, you can sign up, and at the end of it, you will be a Roman citizen. And mm -hmm. yeah. what it, so it created this standing army that they had on tap at any time they wanted. It also created the basis for the book Starship Troopers. Carry on. But basically, from that point on is when Rome went from being a city-state, and I could be wrong on some of this, so this is not gospel truth. This is my understanding, having not studied this extensively. But basically, that's when the Roman Empire took off, because now they had this apparatus that they could go, you know, fight here, fight here. And then this is also when they went from having one legion to having multiple legions. It was not one group of people that was a levy that was called on and that went to war and then went back to their regular lives. They had these professional armies and they had multiple of them. And they would get bored and they'd need stuff to do. And then Julius Caesar would, would be just like, take them out for I'm just spin. Gonna, yeah, and like, I, oh, I know what would increase my uh, standing in the empire. I'll go and commit genocide against these wandering peoples. I'll go kill off a half a million of them and be like, they were attacking. I had to do it. Now I'm a hero of the empire. And so this is the kind of stuff that would happen um, with standing armies. And it was stuff like this that the uh, American colonists were looking at and Gave them pause as yes. to this idea of creating a standing military. So they do stuff like um, they go back much more towards this old model, which is not an, not an old English model. It's an it's an old, almost all of history model, um, military history model. And they say individuals have these right these. Um, it's not so much a right as it is a duty, a responsibility to be prepared to defend the country, which right. means having weapons yep. and equipment. But it also means practice. So in 1363, there are archery laws yeah. in England so that you have to practice your archery on Sundays and on holidays. If you're not working, you have time to yeah. train, so to practice, I combat. So I need to actually go and pull the laws. I need, I need to find a way to actually get the, raw, the original source documents. But my understanding is, based on the research I have done so, done so far, is... You, you know, almost everybody's heard about these horrible puritanical kings that forbade soccer on Sunday. and because oh, they hate fun. Because right? they hate fun. No, <laughs> because to the, the phrase I've read, and I need to confirm it by actually seeing the actual law, was it was time that was better spent for preparation for war. Um, that was their idea, like, oh, no, you shouldn't be playing soccer on Sunday. That's your day to get ready to fight. Yes. And so um, <laughs> the big tradition was Sunday rolls around, you do your church thing, then you go to the butts and you practice with your longbow because longbow practice takes up a lot of time um, to get really good and, and proficient. Yeah, um, what's the saying? To, to build a longbowman, you start with his grandfather? Yeah, if you want to train a longbowman, you start with his grandfather. Yeah. And this was, you know, this was the thing. So That's another Shadiversity reference. Um, 
there's these people <laughs> like in Age of Empires where it's like, oh, the English have a special ability and that's longbows. And I've seen people ask, well, why didn't other countries have longbows? It's like, well, it's not primarily a technological thing. In fact, the longbow was such a big deal in England that England got basically deforested of yew trees. And they imported so, the so they started, from other countries. Well, they made it a tariff. Like, oh, if you want to import goods into, a, into England, you have to bring some yew staves along with that cargo. And so that was a thing where, you, you know, if you wanted to import, you had to get these. And so Europe got about half deforested of yew trees before gunpowder was invented. Yes. And England would plant yew trees uh, traditionally in churchyards so that in a crisis they would actually have a backup supply so they could make some bows. But this was a major thing, you know, they, and they had laws where you had to train, you had to be in possession of a bow, mm -hmm. um, you had to supply your son with a bow correct to his size. Yep, starting, starting at age, age eight, seven. Seven? Yeah, that was the 1513 law. And then at age, I think, 14, he was responsible to provide his own bow and do his own training. But the father, so they, they have all this stuff laid out, and it's not so much for... Um, I don't think it was really so much for, for self-defense at all. Like, they actually yeah, were bad. Yeah, a long is very hard to defend yourself with. Yeah, but, like, it was interesting. Like, they would they would mandate the ranges, and there was a minimum range you could train at, and I think it was, like, 200 yards. Yeah, I can't exactly. remember. So it was, it was very interesting. They were trying to build an apparatus for going to war. This is why no other country really did the longbow thing, because it was a sociological structure that had to be created. It was a and, cultural And thing. sustained. Yeah. And then you find people like, I think it was the reformer, um, the Puritan Cranmer or Ridley, I can't remember which one of those two, Latimer, um, they, they were burned at the stake. Um, but one of them wrote about how horrible it was that gunpowder had been invented because this thing that he did with his dad, which was go out and practice longbow and be in the field and use your body and exercise, now they didn't have to do because of gunpowder. They could just go dice in the towns. And <laughs> That's interesting. It was, it's actually really hum kind of humorous to read, but he's... I, he's actually one of the few people that wrote about the oh, process I've, of shooting I've, I've a longbow. I've heard people talk about, like, oh, the Puritans anti-fighting. No, no, no. He was anti-gunpowder because <laughs> he loved shooting bad guys with longbows so much. The idea of private citizens well-trained with longbows he wanted is to actually go all, his argument. Yeah, he wanted to go all Legolas. That's Robin what he Hood. wanted. Or Robin Hood, yeah. So, um, <laughs> But it's really interesting because historians, um, so much of this stuff gets, gets lost over time. And the question is, well, like, well, what was the draw strength on a longbow? If you have a longbow that's that, you know, 150 pounds, 175 pounds, what is the mechanism for drawing it? You know, it's going to require different um, body movements than drawing a 50-pound bow. I think I need to throw in a third Shadiversity reference here. Okay, go ahead. That was it. That, oh, that okay. Was it. Yeah. okay. So, uh, so these are the kinds of questions that are brought up. But when we look at English history, we see them dealing with a lot of these issues and and um, making it compulsory. And interestingly, Switzerland went a very different route, and their iconic weapon is the um, crossbow, which is kind of similar to uh, the longbow, but it has totally different capabilities. It's, it's a short range, a shorter range. Shorter range, but phenomenally uh, powerful against armor, but it has a super slow reload time. So the only way to really use it is if you have a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a very defensive, strong weapon if you have um, fortifications and stuff and a lot of people to use them. But they had a similar model in that they had an armed citizenry and the cantons required people to be capable with crossbows for the purpose of national defense and local defense because they had a decentralized government structure as well as a decentralized defense structure. Well, and Switzerland is really interesting because they still have that system where basically mm -hmm. you turn, I think it's 18, and you have... I want to say it's one or two years of military service, but you, when you're out, so like in Israel, they have this. This was not that uncommon a thing. You have mandatory service, but in Israel, when you're out, you leave your guns behind and you can't have guns anymore. Um, but in Switzerland, when you're out, you take your gun with you and you're eligible for service for basically until you're like 55. And then when you're out, out, um, you have the option of buying your gun and keeping it with you. Or in some cases, you're given the gun, like if you're an yeah. officer and it's your sidearm. So... Um, so they've kept this system going, and it apparently worked really well for them because in World War I, nobody messed with them. In World War II, nobody messed with them. Yeah. They've just continued doing this thing where, you know, maybe if you're a small country and you have powerful neighbors, there's no way to maintain a standing army big enough to fend them off. But maybe if every single man in the country 
is trained and ready to fight, maybe that works. And that's been their experience. Yeah, the benefit of attacking Switzerland highly <clears throat> outweighed by the cost of attacking Switzerland. Yeah. So like, and this was true not just in World War II times, but prior yeah. to that. This has been the system going back. And the founders knew that. I mean, the main, the main thing that we're, we're trying to talk about here is this idea, which modern historians and, and modern um, Democratic <clears throat> presidential candidates try to, try to pitch that is, uh, the Second Amendment is a failed American experiment that some weird old slave owners thought would be a good idea because of, I don't know, some misguided hatred of other people. The patriarchy, probably. Probably. Is, in fact, a time-honored tradition with a great historical um, <clears throat> track record. And uh, the founders were incredibly well-read uh, historically. And when they write about these things, they're referring to historical events, and they're referring to historical documents that we can go back and we can find and we can read. They're referring to historical events that are, that are recorded and laid down. They're not in modern textbooks, yeah. but um, they definitely happened, and they're in old history <clears throat> books. And there are source documents that describe them. There are source documents that describe a lot of these events. And the laws that were on the books are still here. And more recent um, legal scholars like Blackstone talked about them and talked about the importance of them. So, so this idea that the Second Amendment was a failed experiment that appeared in America and only in America and caused school shootings and there's never been, any, there's never been anything like it elsewhere in history is just ridiculous. What we actually see throughout history is the armed citizenry model where the people of a country maintain that monopoly of violence there is less tyranny, there is less genocide, there is less temptation uh, for the state to do things that it shouldn't do to its own citizens mm -hmm. or to other citizens. You actually see more freedom, you actually see more prosperity, you actually see more peace. And so that is, that is something that it's undeniable when you look at the history and it's undeniable that the founders knew that and they were making these decisions very carefully and in a very informed way. Yeah. When they there's, wrote the Second Amendment. There's kind of this idea like, oh, well, if we centralize power, there will be no rogue, low-level people doing their thing and getting into trouble and killing people. Do you know how many bureaucrats we have at the moment? And <laughs> when you look at the last couple hundred years, the number of wars has just gone through the roof. And um, the number of people killed by their own governments is more, astronomical. More through the roof. Um, you know, it's interesting when I was doing a bunch of study on... Um, Henry V and the Battle of Agincourt, you know, you think, well, he's a king. He's, you know, got all this power. Like, not really. He had this legal claim to a chunk of France. And so he wanted to go fight this war. But before he could go fight the war, he had to travel around England and basically... Um, Win the support. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, it was like, yes, you nobleman, I will, I will hire some of your people if they will come. Uh, oh, I have to hawk my personal um, stuff to, you know, have a res um, basically reserve money set aside to make sure they will get paid even if I don't come back. So, like, that's what he had to do. He had to achieve, you know, get buy-in from these people and, you know, get them to participate in his war. He couldn't just say, like, that's it. I'm done with these French people. We're going to war. These other people had a significant say in the matter. Yes. And, like, we don't have that with our current military system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've the had gigantic Prussian state model does not require that the king have his people on board with him. Right. The and, and, gigantic military machine that the Prussian model requires is kind of a blind obedience model from a professional yes. soldier class that are largely separate from civilians and yeah. civilian life. And, and even take pride in not being politically concerned. Mm hmm. You know, like, um, I think Petraeus was, you know, stated in one meeting that he was proud that he doesn't, he doesn't vote. That's how far he takes this thing. You know, he's a soldier and he take, does the orders of the civil government, but he does not get involved in politics. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was Petraeus. I could be wrong. Yeah. But this is an idea that, that's present. And, um, and it, has, it has led to a lot of bad stuff, I would argue. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of wars that really did not need to be fought. Um, Whereas, you know, when you have, when you have to go, like if it was, if we had a decentralized military and someone in America wanted to go to war, they would have to convince me that I needed to go to that war, that that was really a compelling danger to my family and my, and my business and whatever else. And um, if they couldn't convince me, I would really not be incentivized to go at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, 
it's, it's very fascinating to think about the ramifications of this idea. To take so much of the power of the state and put it back in the hands of the people really limits the ability of the state to do things that it shouldn't do. And obviously the counter argument is it limits the ability of the state to do things that it could do. But it puts that power back in the hands of the people. The people can still decide to do things that they should do. Right. Um, and this is something that, again, this conflict, this idea, this discussion of who should have the monopoly on violence is not new. It's not something that's new to this current generation or this current political uh, election, this presidential election. This year. And it's uh, not going to be settled this year. It's not going to be settled this year. And it's not even new to um, the American founders. This is something that goes way, way, way back. There are tons of things that have been tried, tons of historical experiments that we can look to. And it's something that we at T-Rex obviously feel very strongly about. The need to preserve freedom uh, for people is to re really to preserve the responsibility of people. People really need to be willing to take these responsibilities on themselves in order to preserve these rights. And the good news is that in 2020, there's tons of people who are seeing that they are ultimately the ones who are responsible to protect their families and their neighborhoods, and they're getting the equipment, the best equipment that they can find um, to protect themselves and to protect others. The bad news is that we're probably not equipping people with the ideological understanding that they really need. Yeah, They have a deep fundamental or, or a subconscious understanding that no one is coming to save them. Um, hopefully, people will really start to think through yeah. the ramifications of that. Hopefully, the guns, we were talking today, and we're like, you know what? Guns are like a gateway drug. They're a gateway drug <laughs> to liberty. Yes. So people start realizing, <laughs> you know, hey, hmm. I'm responsible for stuff myself. Um, yes. You know, one of the first things a person should be strongly impressed with when they pick up a gun is personal responsibility. I can pull that trigger and bad stuff can happen and it will be my fault. Mm -hmm. um, these are the kinds of ideas that are, are impressed very quickly and very powerfully by guns. So I'm hoping that these new um, democratic gun owners will be impressed by these ideas and they will start thinking about personal responsibility, liberty, and they'll, they'll take these ideas through. Um, and the good news is that, can't speak for everyone, but there are a lot of uh, more conservative, more Republican folks that have bought guns simply as a statement uh, or as a way to just kind of hedge the market because they knew they were going to be scarce. And owning the guns and thinking about them in a practical, tangible way actually did cause them to think through the hard issues and do the research and consider the ramifications of the rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. that are attached to them. Yeah. They kind of stopped being sheep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm... Personally, so I've been studying military history for about 20-something years now, off and on, as a, you know, uh, more than a, a casual basis, but certainly not a professional basis. I'm an amateur. Um, but I'm pretty excited by what's been happening in the American gun industry with the numbers of people flocking in and buying guns and with the increased acceptance of, you know, private ownership of things like this um, and things like this and things like this. And... I'm hopeful that, oh, it will, three holes. that it will provoke a return to a different idea about how militaries should be set up and how governments should be structured and what powers governments should have and should not have. Um, because for me, the thing that really drove me to appreciate this has been the, um, the incredible history of genocide that we saw in the last hundred years or so. Mm -hmm. um, the common denominator through so many of the genocides was the regular people had been completely disarmed. And so I'm really hoping that as we see this shift towards more people having guns, yes, there will be some um, mass shootings and stuff to go along with it. Yeah, but when people who don't have character get yes. guns, sometimes this is bad a stuff happens. Yeah, and and this is why when we talk about gun ownership, we're not saying that everybody should have guns. We are saying the government is not the institution to limit gun ownership. Right. There are actually people that should not have guns. Well, that's not the government's job. That's not the job. Yeah. So. My, my great hope is that we will see a great reduction in the number of genocides that happen in the next hundred years. Um, and regrettably, there will be places where, you know, they have no guns, um, like China. And we will probably continue to see genocides in places like that. Um, we're probably going to get banned for me just saying that. But, hey, you know, 
<laughs> Maybe we can save it by pointing out that uh, you can go see Mulan on Disney Plus right now. It was yeah. made with the assistance of the Chinese government. And uh, I'm I think sure. that ever happens there. And the Chinese police are just doing a bang up job in Hong Kong. Right. Just getting along with the people like a house on fire. That's what I'm told. There's also, you know, other stuff we could say about Mulan, but we're probably not allowed. Yes. So, so this, is, this is a big thing that motivates me. This mm -hmm. is a big thing why I'm interested and so passionate about T-Rex arms because holsters are like a little um, business card for freedom. What we're saying is carry a gun so you can protect yourself and others. And then once people are on board with that, hopefully that idea that has been, that has been planted in their minds will grow and will expand and they'll, they'll, they'll go from that to more things and they'll start questioning government and control over other things. You can grow a tree of liberty in the blood of tyrants, but you can also grow a tree of liberty by reading about people that have come before yeah. and learning the lessons that they learned and the things that they were willing to fight and die for. And my hope is if enough people will try to grow a tree of liberty just by owning guns and, and taking responsibility and stuff like that, we will never need to shed a bunch of blood mm. in order to secure that liberty. Kind of like um, Magna Carta, uh, Runnymede. No the battle, battle that never happened. The battle that never happened because they were ready. They were able to oppose a tyrant. And they were able to secure their rights. So that's that's our big hope. Um, some people might accuse us of being warmongers for having all this stuff and selling holsters and stuff, but we're actually peacemongers. We're actually yeah, we're peacemongers. We're trying to do a really good job at peacemongering. Yeah. The, Seek peace through superior firepower. Yep. And being ready. Yeah, being ready is a huge deal. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that before, but the whole reason that the Battle of Runnymede didn't happen was because people were ready to fight on yeah. the right side. Being ready to fight on the right side. There's also a biblical, we should do this in a different live because we're out of time. Yeah. There's also a biblical trend that a lot of these ideas are based on. In 1 Samuel 13, you can read about how the Philistines had invaded Israel mm -hmm. and they had taken away all of the weapons. Obviously, they didn't have guns back then. They took away all the weapons yep. and they even made it illegal to be a blacksmith because yep. a blacksmith could make guns. Or and so weapons. They make weapons. <laughs> blacksmiths can make guns, but just not at that time in history. Um, and so uh, Israel was in a really terrible position of having to fight an enemy when they couldn't even make their own weapons. Yeah. Um, they were ready to resist evil, but they didn't have the tools until later. Um, be ready to resist evil and also get the tools. Yep. Um, that is something that is incredibly important um, for us to be thinking about. Yeah. And uh, we should probably wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching. If you're on YouTube, listening, if you're on the podcast, mm -hmm. uh, go to the T-Rex Arms newsletter and also uh, the T-Rex Arms website and sign up for our newsletter. Yep. Um, because Cause... we're doing a lot of cool stuff on there. And after uh, that Uyghur Chinese genocide reference, we might not be on YouTube much longer. You never know. Right. Because talk about freedom is dangerous. Not free. Yes. <laughs> So thank you so much for watching. We will see you next week about this time, if we're still here.